Welcome to today's virtual Hinckley Forum. The Hinckley Institute is a nonpartisan institute at the University of Utah. The Hinckley provides an array of transformative experiences for students through internships, forums, and classes. Hinckley Forums seek to foster public discourse and civil debate on the most current and pressing issues, bringing in local, national, and international thought leaders. Today's forum is presented in partnership with the University of Utah's Political Science Department and Alumni Association. We would like to thank our streaming sponsor, AARP Utah, for making our virtual forums this fall possible. And we would also like to thank our media sponsor, KCPW, for recording and rebroadcasting our forums as part of the Hinckley Radio Hour. Forum is security and voting rights in the 2020 election. We are joined by panelists Ricky Hatch, Weber County Clerk and Auditor, Amelia Powers Gardner, Utah County Clerk and Auditor, Justin Lee, State Elections Director, Sherry Swenson, Salt Lake City County Clerk, and our moderator, Frank Pignanelli, partner with Foxley and Pignanelli. If you have questions for our panelists, go ahead and enter them into the YouTube chat. We will address questions once we have completed the moderated panel discussion. And with that, I will turn the time over to our moderator. Well, thank you. And uh, uh, welcome to all the Kingley fans and the audience. Uh, this is a follow-up to a panel discussion we had a couple months ago about vote by mail. And although voting is always interesting for a lot of us political insiders, the whole issue of voting, the security of voting, and voting rights is now one of the top issues for this election, both the presidential election, but even here in Utah. And it's great that we have the experts, really the state of Utah, to talk to all of us about it. And so one of the things I wanna follow up on is vote by mail. Vote by mail continues to be an issue nationally and locally. We covered it very well in the previous seminar, but I thought maybe we did go through it very quickly here. And maybe just if you could start out about how we, uh, vote by mail is accepted in Utah and, and some of the issues that you think maybe have been handled by the state. Justin? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, as most people know, we've been doing vote by mail here in Utah. Um, Countywide and then eventually statewide for, for many years, really the first county was Duchesne County back in 2012. Uh, and they ran their election all by mail. But even before that, we had what was called no fault absentee. Uh, any voter could re request a by mail ballot. Um, and so we had you know, thousands and thousands of people voting by mail. Um, and county by county, we've gone to all vote by mail until earlier this year in March for the presidential primary, uh, we had all counties voting by mail. Um, now, that, that's really good for us because we're already in a place where a lot of other states would like to be um, as they're, they're scrambling to deal with the pandemic and figure out how to vote by mail, how to, how to safely socially distance and, and let people vote. Um, so here in Utah, I'll say I don't anticipate uh, any big issues with by mail. This isn't something that's new for us. Um, our counties know how to do this. Um, and so I don't anticipate we'll have a lot of big issues uh, like you may see in some other states. Great. Well, there's, and there's also some advantages to vote by mail that uh, we've experienced for the state. Maybe uh, Ricky, Molly, or uh, excuse me, Ricky, Sherry, Amelia, you talk about those, whether it's the cost, education, uh, things like that on the vote by mail that you expect to experience in November. I think Utah County, we really got our education on vote by mail in 2018. That was the first major election that Utah County had vote by mail. And we had four and five hour lines in some places. And what we learned from that is that vote by mail is like any other form of voting. If done well, it works well. But if done poorly, it doesn't work well. And we learned a lot through our years leading up to this point. I don't foresee any major issues this year because we have, we have that learning curve. And we did learn from vote by mail and from failures in the past. One of the other benefits uh, of voting by mail, um, in my mind, the biggest benefit is uh, a more informed voter uh, because the ballot is proactively placed in the voter's hand three weeks before the election. And they have the chance to research that on their own and make their selections rather than being surprised at the ballot box. But the other benefit, uh, which is a nice byproduct, is increased voter turnout. Uh, the studies have repeatedly shown that increase, uh, voting by mail increases turnout four to nine percentage points uh, in, a, in a high turnout election and uh, even more in low turnout elections such as primaries or municipal elections. So those are a couple of other big benefits of voting by mail. 
one of the interesting things about the, the voting by mail controversy across the country is, is that everyone seems to suggest in the discussion that Utah does it right. So congratulations to all of you. But one of the issues that's coming out now is it's called the Red Mirage Blue Shift. And we're hearing more and more about that. We're probably going to hear more about it leading to November. So does anyone want to, want to explain to our audience what that means and what that could result in? No one wants to talk about that. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's so no, I, I you know I one of the one of the things that's been brought up is that um, you know sometimes Republicans seem to be more hesitant about vote by mail, and that's part of the national discussion right now. Um, so we we could see a scenario where we see a lot of Republican votes come on election day, um, and then as more by, by mail ballots come in, and, and presumably in some areas those could be more Democratic votes. Um, the, the results will shift um, and we'll, we'll see more coming after Election Day. Um, I don't know that we'll see something like that here in Utah. Um, it, it hasn't really seemed to matter which party you are for vote by mail here in Utah. It's, it's, it's embraced by both parties, but the results nationally could, could see some interesting shifts after Election Day. We'll have to really wait and see. Yeah, I know um, a, a lot of people keep looking at the 4th Congressional District and I know in Utah County, more votes typically just means more Republican votes. Mm -hmm. So if I have a lot of if I have a lot of ballots that we haven't counted on Election Day in Utah County, that typically just means more Republicans voted. So I really think that uh, that in Utah, that that mirage is not going is not going to happen. Interesting. Also, I think um, one of the things that maybe brings about that idea is the convenience that people have when they get a vote by mail ballot where they may not be as apt to take the time to go to a polling place, find out if it was a traditional polling place, where that place is. So just the convenience of having individuals receive a ballot, be able to vote that ballot and return it in their own time frame instead of having them find out where they need to go and show up in person. Right. Now, uh, recently, Utah's highlighted as, as one of the best states for election security in Utah. Now, there was an article in the, in the papers this morning about some of the, uh, some ballot printers or something that were sending wrong places. But for the most part, Utah's recognized for election security here, which is obviously a big deal, and continues to be a big deal as we face threats from countries trying to disrupt our system. So, Justin, you want to talk a little bit to why we get that recognized and maybe some of the others talk about the different features you utilize to make sure that the system is secure and safe. Absolutely. You know, election security really came onto the, the, the public consciousness after the 2016 election um, and leading up to 2018. And it, it's continued since then. Um, you know, I think the first thing we need to do is, is always distinguish between uh, two different parts of election security. One part is actually getting into the election machines, um, you know, talking about actually hacking the vote or hacking the voter rolls. Um, another part is disinformation, misinformation that's, that's put out there. Um, and now, Utah has been in a very good place for, for a couple of reasons. One, we, we have a very good uh, cybersecurity team here in the state um, that was already doing a lot of good cyber work um, before uh, the 2016 election. Um, we sit under the state umbrella. We don't have our own... Uh, state elections office security team um, that, that works on the cyber operations side. And so we already had a lot of the, the infrastructure, the sensors, um, and the relationships built up at the state, which kept us safe in 2016. We were not one of the states that were, were hacked um, or, or had issues like that uh, in 2016. And since then, we've just expanded. Uh, we've increased our monitoring. We've increased training for the county officials. Um, we, we've recently released additional monitoring tools that are available to the county. And then we have great relationships with our federal partners. Um, locally here with Homeland Security, with the, the FBI and others, we have a good network and, and, and infrastructure that helps with security. And vote by mail is another good security thing um, because it's paper-based. Um, paper is a really good security feature because it's pretty much impossible to hack paper. Um, so if, if everything were to go horribly wrong, heaven forbid, we could hand count these ballots at the end of the day if, if there was some major problem with the machine. So all of these things combined um, help us be in a very secure place. And to add to that, when we mail a ballot to the active registered voters, each ballot has a unique ID number 
So the registered voters are in the database, our statewide database, and we do not create a ballot for an individual who is not an active registered voter. And that, um, that ID number is printed on the ballot return envelope. And so when the ballots are returned to us, there's th that number is scanned in, attributed to that voter. So the idea of someone sitting out there and creating these ballots in their living room or wherever and getting them through our system just could not happen because again, every ballot assigned to a voter has a unique ID number correlated to a voter in the database. Yeah, on top of that, our scanners, our, our scanner manufacturers have preferred paper. And the preferred paper isn't one that you buy at home at Office Depot. You're not heading down to Office Depot and getting this paper. It is custom paper that is made by the paper manufacturers that is shipped directly to the ballot printers. And we have to order that well ahead of time. And so this isn't something that you could literally just create at home or even create at a print shop if you don't have the right paper. I've seen ballots that someone maybe spilled on their ballot and they tried to uh, photocopy it and send it and our printers kick it out. Interesting. That's great information. That, uh, that, uh, that should breed confidence. Maybe talk a little bit what we worry about with confidence is that you know, some of the statements that are made by national leaders, but also foreign and local concerns, because although you're working very hard, all of you and your colleagues in other counties to ensure that the system is safe and that it's viable. But uh, talk a little about what, what we have to read in the media. Well, I think one of the biggest things that we deal with with the media is the fact that some of the states that are getting ready to do vote by mail, um, they haven't done the groundwork. I know that some states that are that are doing vote by mail overnight, they're sending it to every voter, not just active registered voters, and they haven't spent the time to pull uh, people who have who have died off their lists. And so there's a lot of concern there. Some of the things that people are concerned about in other places, we do. You know, we run our list through the National Change of Address database. We run it through uh, vital statistics and we look at deceased voters and we pull them off of our lists. Some of these areas aren't doing that. We also check every single signature. And in order to do that, we have to have a signature on file for those people to check every signature. Not every state has that. So we've done a lot of things. Um, Sometimes we did it getting ready for vote by mail and sometimes it now becomes part of our everyday process. We're doing things that some of these other states aren't and we still address those concerns because the national media brings that up. Wow, okay. Well, I know, I do know that there's some concern about uh, the, the, you know, the, whether it's foreign countries or whatever, but it's nice to hear that there are systems in place so once again, we're voting in a pandemic. I think there was some hope that we would be out of this, but we're not out of it. Uh, so we're voting in a pandemic. So what does that mean in terms for the voter, whether it's using the ballot, whether it's uh, voting in person, what happens to the ballot? What, 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 do we, what do you see happening on election day or leading up to election day on election day for voters and for uh, their use of the ballot? So we are encouraging voters to use their vote by mail ballot. If they receive a ballot in the mail, I think it would be unfortunate if they just show up to vote in person because they want to. We're sure that will happen, but nevertheless, uh, the things that will be different this time will be socially distancing, our voting machines, our poll workers, and the people in line at the vote centers, and having to sanitize surfaces. So. If you can imagine with 20 people in line, six foot distancing, we'd have a, a line 120 feet long. So we are strongly encouraging people if they get a, a ballot in the mail, please use that ballot because the vote centers really are meant for people who did not receive a ballot. Okay. I think one of the key things to keep in mind is that 90% of our voters are voting by mail anyway. So for 90% of the people, nothing is going to change. And in the June election, I had over 98% of people in my county vote using their mail-in ballots. So if that, if that trend continues for 90 to 95 to 98% of the people in the state, 
nothing is going to change. I think that's key to rem remember. So very, every, go ahead. I'm sorry, Ricky, go I'm ahead. Sorry, every, every county in the state is going to have at least one in-person voting option that's required by state law. And as clerks, we, that's important to us as well to provide that uh, option for those who never received their ballot, the dog ate it, something like that. That happens. Uh, and we always want to be able to accommodate them. But our, our uh, message is, if you got it in the mail, uh, send it back by mail or by Dropbox and uh, don't, don't come wait in line on election day because you're just in almost every county, you're gonna receive the same paper ballot that you got in the mail, whether you come in person or, or via mail. And, and uh, Ricky, I really wanna have you emphasize that because I think some people think, well, I really enjoy going to, to about, you know, voting in person, going behind the curtain and voting. And that's not going to be their experience for the most part. They're just going to get the same ballot they got in the mail and then find a place to drop it off. Is that correct? That's that's correct. Uh, and of course, it's going to vary a little bit by each county. But uh, if you really want the experience of voting in person, please come on down, bring your ballot and drop it in the drop box. You'll have that in-person experience without having to wait in a long line and, and get a replacement ballot. You know, and Greg, I think there are counties, the only difference in some counties is um, legislature allowed for in-person, inside, in-person, outdoors, or drive-through voting. Um, so you are going to have some counties, Davis County, for example, is going to have a drive-through vote center similar to what they had in the primary. So you'll go down and you'll stay in your car and they'll hand you a ballot um, and, and then you'll vote it. Um, but, but what's been said is absolutely correct. For most voters, this is going to feel very normal. Because uh, that's what we already do in Utah. Um, for a few people, they'll have a slightly different experience if they decide to go in person, but not vastly different than if they just vote by mail from home. Right. Amelia, you had something? Yeah, I was going to say, I know in my county and in, in Ricky's county up in Weber County, what we're both doing is we'll print you off a ballot and hand you an envelope. And you'll still fill out that paper ballot, put it in an envelope, just like you would if you filled out the one you had at home. And we're going to have you put that in a drop box. So you'll still, even if you come down and you wait in line, we're going to hand you the same paper ballot. We're going to give you an envelope and you're going to go put it in a drop box, just the same. Uh, the one thing I want to make sure that people understand is that every county has a way that we can facilitate any voter with a disability. So if you are a voter with a disability and you have a hard time filling out that paper ballot, or if you don't have the ability to fill out the paper ballot independently and you want to vote independently and have that secret ballot, every county has accommodations for people with disabilities. And we are more than happy to accommodate those people either before election day, in early voting or on election day. And our election day will look like it has in the past. It won't be issuing uh, by mail ballots, so to speak, or paper ballots. However, we do have also early vote locations, in-person vote centers. We're hoping we can spread this out a little bit over the last several elections, people haven't utilized our in-person early voting locations, and we hope they will if they do need to vote in person for this election. So voter fraud, uh, we, we hear about voter fraud across the country. You know, once in a while, somebody will pop off here in Utah about it, but it seems like it's pretty rare here in Utah. Uh, Amelia, I know that you had an interesting comment about voter fraud, and we talked about it last week. Yeah, I, I know that in my county, the closest thing that we get to attempted voter fraud is we tend to get well-meaning parents of college students or missionaries, and they'll get their student or their missionary's ballot and they'll try to fill it out and sign for them. And we catch that because not only does the signature not match, but we can pull up the signatures for everybody who's a registered voter in that household. And we oftentimes can find exactly who in that household signed that ballot. And I call them up and I let them know, hey, I'm pretty sure you didn't mean to commit a felony, but you cannot sign for your son or your daughter or your husband. And therefore we can't count this vote. However, I am gonna mark your voter registration. And if we see that this is a pattern, if you attempt this again, then we will turn your name and the evidence over to the FBI so that they can pursue a felony charge. I've never had a repeat person. And we look, we check every time we find someone and pull up their voter file, let's see if they're a repeat. No one's been a repeat. We don't have people here in Utah County, at least, intentionally trying to fill out other people's ballots. Um, 
I, I wish I could catch someone committing voter fraud so that we could show that we're serious about it, but really it's well-meaning people and I've never seen a repeat. So other than the well-meaning missionary mom, do we, do we see anything else in Utah in terms of fraud? Well, our experience has been much the same as what Amelia described, that they're not understanding that that isn't okay. And when they find out, it's, it's quite interesting. They're a little surprised, um, but nevertheless, I just uh, received a report for the Brennan Center for Justice, and they talked about the fact that the, when they've studied this for previous elections, even nationally, that the, the percentage is so minuscule that it's more likely that an American would be hit by lightning than poses someone else when voting. <laughs> Interesting. So it's so it's so it's uh, safer to to vote than it is to be out in a lightning storm. Okay. Right. Unless you're by a metal ballot drop box, then I don't know. Um, <laughs> Good point. Good point. Well, uh, that's something I know that some people are interested in. Uh, the Postal Service. Let's talk a little bit about the relationship between uh, the county clerks the state office and the postal service and because obviously that's been an issue that's been raised too uh, in terms of any delays there's been some lawsuits about it uh, any, any thoughts about the postal service you know this this is one of the benefits that we have of of having done vote by mail for several years is we have both at the state level and the county level good relationships with our post office officials um, we've been in constant contact with with our regional and state reps um, and and they assure us that they can handle the volume of vote by mail ballots, they can get them done timely because they've done it before, they know what to expect. Um, and I know our, our, our county clerks have great relationships with their local post office officials and, and Amelia and Sherry and Ricky can speak to that. But we, we really don't anticipate any, I, I feel like a broken record saying that, any major issues with the post office. Um, again, because we've done this so many times. And I've been in communication with our representatives from this Salt Lake Main Post Office, they have assured me that they have not experienced equipment cuts, uh, personnel cuts. They are very ready to handle our ballots. And so I think it's kind of unfortunate that some of our voters are feeling like they're afraid to return their ballots by mail, but we feel very confident that the post office is ready and that we'll receive those ballots back and likewise be able to get the ballots out to the voters. In discussions with the federal post office, uh, they've said that if everybody mailed their ballots back on the same exact same day on election day, they would see about a 10% increase in their mail traffic, which they can handle. The other nice thing is if as a voter, you don't trust the postal service for whatever reason, we have a ton of drop boxes throughout the state. Uh, each county has their own uh, uh, amount, but there are well over, I, I wanna say 130 drop boxes throughout the state where uh, within your own county, you as a voter can drop that. And that never gets touched by any, anybody other than election judges. It doesn't go through the postal service. Uh, and so that's an, a great control if you just don't want to use the postal service to mail your ballot back. Yeah, I think on, on election day in June, on the primary election, I received about 5,000 ballots through the postal service and 29,000 in our drop boxes on election day in June. So people are using those drop boxes and those work just as well. Uh, but I have, no, I have no confidence issues with our local post office. Our post office has been incredibly proactive at reaching out to us and making sure that they know exactly when our ballots are going to hit and they ask if we need anything. Um, we have already arranged what our pickup schedule is gonna be like. We have our liaison at our local postal branch that knows who to work with at our office. I mean, it, we, we have a, an established relationship and we have full confidence in our postal service. I mean, this is uh, good to hear because as you know, some weeks ago, the national office for the postal service sent out a letter to all, all American citizens and it caused a controversy. There was a lawsuit in Colorado and, and so it was good to hear this locally, but talk a little bit about what happened because you had to, you had to deal with that letter too that was encouraging people to do absentee ballots and things like that. And maybe Justin, if you got something on that because I know you had to deal with them. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it, it's similar to, I think, the polls we see in Congress. Nobody likes Congress as a whole, but we all like our individual 
Congress people. Uh, the polls tend to go that way. I don't know that we love USPS nationally right now, but we really like our local officials. They're working very well with us. And, and one of the reasons is, is for anyone that doesn't know, uh, the National Post Office decided to send a postcard out to every residence in the entire country. And it was the same postcard for the entire country, had the same information. And the idea of the postcard was basically telling people, get ready early, plan what you're going to do, um, which was good. But then it had a bullet point that said, request your absentee ballot no later than 15 days before the election, which for states like, like us, like Colorado, Oregon, Washington, Hawaii, Nevada, uh, that makes no sense. You don't need to request an absentee ballot. Um, and so that was confusing for some voters um, who, who are expecting to receive a ballot, know that that's coming in the mail, and then to get something telling them to request an absentee ballot um, is a little bit confusing. So. Um, we let the post office know we weren't happy with that. Several national organizations of elections directors, secretary of states, let the national post office know that, you know, if you're going to be sending stuff out, you really need to check in with the election officials. So we get the best information that's not confusing out to voters. Um, luckily for us here in Utah, there, there wasn't a major blowback over this. There, there didn't seem to be widespread confusion, but still not, an, not a postcard we really appreciated. So Sherry or Ricky or Amelia, did, did, do you, do, you, do you worry about this postcard causing problems? Do you think people have become so accustomed to mail-in balloting that it's not going to be a problem? It increased our, our phone calls and our emails from individuals asking and thinking that they needed to request a ballot, but we were able to clarify that. And honestly, when I heard about it or saw it, I got um, on the phone immediately with our local main branch. They weren't aware of it either, quite honestly, so they hadn't even seen it, but the reason Colorado was so upset is they, they encouraged people to mail their ballots by a week before election day on the postcard. And that didn't sync with uh, Colorado's deadlines for when their ballots had to be there. So that's why the Colorado Secretary of State filed a lawsuit. Yeah, you know, I, I've received a little bit more of an increase in calls, people thinking that they needed to request a ballot. I, I received a few Facebook messages from friends saying, hey, I'm pretty sure I'm gonna get a ballot, but this postcard was a little confusing. Do I have to? And I had to clarify that. However, that has not caused nearly as much as the barrage of telling people to register to vote on social media. We are getting thousands and thousands. In fact, we've had over 32,000 voter registrations in the month of September. In 2019, we had 22,000 total. But in September of 2020, we've had 32,000. And a lot of these are people that are already registered, but they're still clicking that link on social media just to verify their registration. And then they're submitting another registration that we have to go in. And we, there's no way for us to bulk say, hey, all of these people are already registered. We have to go through one by one and check that. So I think the social media help is actually causing us a lot more work than this postcard did. Wow. So what's what, so these are uh, are these candidates or these uh, public interest groups or others saying? It's, it's mostly Facebook and Instagram. Yeah, they're, they're making very the concerted push. And, and and I like Amelia says, and this is a problem all over the place. Is we've actually had to recently updated our website, our, our voter registration website to try to quell some of this uh, just duplicate registration issue. Um, because people, you know, it's really easy to say, just go register to vote, even if you're already registered, you know, that makes you feel better. And in theory, that sounds like a good idea, but then the county clerks have to process a lot of unnecessary registrations, which isn't really helping anybody. So while we do appreciate people letting people know they should register to vote, we've also reached out to Facebook, um, who controls Instagram, so really just Facebook, letting them know we'd prefer them to send them to a place where they can verify their registration first, instead of sending them directly to the voter registration site. Because um, it, it is overwhelming the clerks in some ways. Well, maybe we can use this to piggyback on well, what is a topic is the worry, you have all your security things in place for voting that where, where there could be fraud is not in the voting, but it's in the registration. That's where there could be. So maybe talk a little bit about that. Uh, yeah, the most common form of uh, election fraud really is not, it doesn't happen with the casting of a ballot. It happens when the voter registers. And sometimes it's 
it's just like it's it's well intentioned. So uh, it's somebody who is in the middle of moving, and they might keep their old registrate their old address because they just don't want to go through the hassle of re-registering and figuring out where they vote for the new location. Uh, that's actually elections registration fraud, or uh, others may split their time between two different locations uh, and uh, and may choose their uh, their registration based off of where they would like to vote as opposed to where they feel their residence is. Uh, so that's common. In fact, in Utah, the, the most frequently documented cases of election fraud of the very few that we have, and you have to go back a few years to find it, but it really there was about, I, I wanna say it was about 10 years ago, about 70 cases of election registration fraud. Um, and so that that's really a higher risk, especially when you're in vote by mail, is that registration fraud that is really a higher risk than uh, than actual voting fraud. But just to um, talk a little bit about what's required when someone registers to vote, they have to, whether it's online with a paper mail-in form, they have to list either their Utah driver's license or state ID card number, or the last four digits of their social security number. And so for every registered voter, that has to be verified before the, we make that registration valid and make them an active voter. If it isn't verified, they're, they're put in a suspense situation in our database until, and then they're even notified um, with a letter that we send them telling them that, you know, there's something that needs to be clarified on their registration. So that's an, and another uh, safety check is that we send them a voter information card to the address they list on um, the registration form. And if that is returned as undeliverable or whatever, that's a red flag for us that something's wrong with that address. So is there, we, we, again, we hear about a national level. In fact, it's become a, a major issue in some states like Georgia and others, voter suppression. Uh, groups of uh, people are, are, it's difficult for the vote. One of the, one of the arguments in Florida is, is uh, uh, convicted felons who've now been, done their time being able to vote. Is there voter suppression in Utah? Have you ever witnessed it or has there ever been a problem? Would you expect any problems with that? No, I think the only form of voter suppression that I've been aware of is long lines, right? We mail you a ballot. We want you to be able to vote. So we mail you a ballot. And then we also, on top of mailing you a ballot, we provide in-person voting locations. And if you didn't get a mail-in ballot or if your kids thought it was junk mail and threw it away, then we provide in-person voting. And we work very hard to keep our line short. I know that obviously I came into office on the tail end of long lines by my predecessor. And I've worked very hard to say that uh, in 2020, my hope is that no one in Utah County stands in line for more than 45 minutes. I want every line to be 45 minutes or less for people to be able to vote. That's my goal because I know that maybe if you are a single mom, you can't stand in line all day, right? You, if you have to get a babysitter to go vote, then I want that to be something that you can do in a timely amount. But really beyond that, we work very hard as clerks to ensure that you have as many ways to vote as possible. Um, we ensure that every person with a disability can vote, every person that has an address that we can mail them a ballot. So we work really hard to ensure that people have access to a ballot and to cast their vote. And uh, Justin, as the state elections officer, state laws, uh, how do you view them in terms of suppressing the votes? You know, our state laws, um, I think we have very good state laws as, as far as limiting any kind of suppression or really eliminating it. We have, you know, any way you want to register to vote, uh, whether it's online, whether it's in person, whether it's on election day, there's ways to do that. Um, we have in-person early voting. We have in-person voting on election day. We have by mail voting. Our voter ID laws are, are not particularly stringent. We have them. Um, but, but there's all kinds of things you can use for voter ID. So I don't think we have um, in the statute any real barriers uh, for, for people to vote. Um, I mean, if, if somebody waits till 8 p.m. on election day to, to get their act in order, you know, that's always difficult to help somebody. But for anyone that's paying attention, for anyone that wants to, to legitimately be involved in the process, there's not really a lot of barriers. And I noticed there was that issue in Garfield County, but that but your office, you and your office corrected that immediately. 
uh, when there was a, a clerk that was putting up a little bit of barrier there. That's right. Yeah, we, we had a clerk that was was adding in some some requirements that really aren't there in the law, and uh, whether that's from some misunderstanding or, or you know just just not enough training or, or whatever it may be. But yeah, we we reach out if we hear any issues um, with with any county. Uh, we have good good relationships with our county clerks, and and we call up and make sure that we're all on the same page of following the law. Well, you know, uh, we have a couple of topics, but we do have some questions here. I think it's kind of uh, interesting. Um, uh, first question, uh, do you think that the political polarization of mail-in ballots this election will give an opportunity for people to delegitimize the elections locally, statewide, and nationally? So basically, the polarization that you have, does that cause problems of legitimacy in our local elections and our national elections? I'll throw this out. I can talk to that. I have a, a friend at uh, MIT who focuses on elections, Charles Stewart. And he's done these studies uh, and surveys for uh, years and looked at decades worth of information. And in the end, the party whose uh, presidential candidate loses doesn't trust the election results. The party whose candidate wins, they are more likely to trust the election results. It's been proven every four years uh, for probably 40 years. Um, so it, it's always gonna happen. Uh, it seems particularly acute. Uh, this election seems really strong. Uh, and as election officials, what we do is we put on our referee hats and we just make sure that there's confidence in the process and that it's secure and we don't let anybody, anything that's under our control be swayed by any political influence. I think as, as far as vote by mail goes and polarization here in Utah, I don't think that's going to be an issue because it doesn't matter whether it's a a blue leaning county or a red leaning county, we all use vote by mail and we all have confidence in each other's processes. So locally, I don't think that's going to play into the, the legitimacy of our elections. However, nationally, I mean, we can't really say what's gonna happen nationally, right? We, we tend to be one of the best in the nation. And so we have confidence in our processes, but if other people don't have confidence in what the other states do, then, then it could be a question. Like Ricky said, it'll probably be whoever loses is going to try to delegitimize this election. You know, and, and I think jumping on that, there's, there's not really any such thing as a national election. Um, and, and there's barely such thing as a state election. Um, I don't want to make my job sound superfluous, but, um, but really all elections are run at the local level. Um, all of the work of sending out ballots, you know, getting the machines ready, counting the ballots, all takes place at the county level. Um, so if you trust your local county election officials, you trust the outcome of the election. Um, and, and I think that's a message that we, we need to keep, you know, reiterating that um, no one at the national level is counting ballots. No one at the state level is counting ballots. County clerks are counting ballots. And we have so many safeguards and, and processes in place to help make sure that's secure that we can trust them to do their job. And, and I think that's the difficult thing is, is nationally, it, it, there's a conversation going on that doesn't necessarily match up with how the elections are run on the ground. And just to add to that, um, we have had so many visitors through our election management center, watching the processing of ballots. We've had elected officials, party members, candidates, even international visitors. And so we are under, a lot of scrutiny to do everything right. So it isn't just us as county clerks doing this in some little obscure situation. I mean, um, we have made it very transparent. We have surveillance cameras. Everything is done so fastidiously that when they walk away, they say, they're always impressed. People do not realize what we put into making sure that every ballot counts, whether it's a a vote by mail ballot or an, an electronic machine ballot. And we, we take great pride in that. So you, had, you guys uh, interact with your colleagues across the country and I'm sure you still have conversations with them. How do you see this election playing out? Will there be any uh, demands for another election or recounts? What, what are you hearing, not just locally but also across the country from your colleagues? I would say yes, all of the above. I mean, they're already demanding a recount now and we haven't even had the election yet, right? So I, I, it's just, 
it's like Ricky said, I mean, whoever doesn't win this election is going to demand a recount. But what's key is that we ensure that people have have confidence in our process here in Utah County and in Weber County and in Salt Lake County and et cetera. We need to make sure that people have confidence in our process because that's the one thing we can control. And, uh, and that's where people need to understand is that there isn't, like Justin said, there isn't some nameless, faceless organization far off counting these votes. This is your local county clerk, the people that you've elected. And, and as long as we can bring the conversation back to that and help people recognize that, that we're the ones counting this election, then I think we'll have more confidence in the results. Uh, this, the next question, and I, and I like this question because I have had personal experiences. After sending your ballot in the mail, is there a way to confirm your ballot was delivered successfully and your vote is counted? Justin, you guys have a really cool thing on your website. Can you talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, go to vote.utah.gov, put in your information, and it will tell you if your ballot's been counted. Um, it tells you if it's been sent to you, tells you if it's been received by the county clerk, and then it will tell you when it's counted. Um, so it's actually very easy to track that. And on top of that, some counties have their own systems for tracking those. Um, if you really want double confirmation, you can go look at county websites to, to track that information as well. But it never needs to be a secret whether or not your vote was counted. That's something that any voter can confirm. So uh, Sherry, Ricky, or Amelia, do you do you piggyback on the state or do you have your own uh, feature where people can track your ballot? We have the states. Um, we're having voters use that, but we do need to let them know that if they send their ballot in one day, it may not show up as counted the next day or even for a few days, depending on the volume of ballots we're receiving because it's a, a laborious process to go through and verify the signatures on those envelopes and they need to give us a little time to make sure they do get processed. You know, it's, it's interesting and voters do have this um, and expectation. And I think that's because so many things are just instantaneous uh, feedback on everything. Um, you know, provisional ballots are a good example, vote by mail, but provisional ballots, um, inevitably every year someone goes to a polling place, they don't have ID or, or whatever the reason is they have to vote a provisional ballot. Now, when you vote a provisional ballot, you're given a number um, for that provisional ballot and a phone number where you can call and see if it's been counted. And, and every year we have people who go to the polls on election day, and as they're walking out of the polls, they call us up and say, hey, has my provisional ballot been counted? And we say, well, when did you drop it off? And they say, well, about two minutes ago. And we say, well, no, it hasn't been counted yet. That's going to take a couple of days. But, but yeah, Sherry is absolutely right. They're there's, there's good information and, and then there's an expectation sometimes for instantaneous information that, that isn't going to be a thing. Uh, in my personal experience, I had a relative who I was telling them about this feature and looked up and, and said that was, the ballot was in process. And even though my, I'd sent mine in after they had, they were quite upset. And then the election day happens, it's still set in process. And so they were raising a stink. The, 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 the relatives were raising a stink about it. And then they called the, the county clerk's office to, to complain. And they said, well, we sent you a ballot and nothing happened. Then you asked for another ballot. So we have, so we basically they had forgotten that there was another ballot out there. And the clerk's office was doing their job to make sure that another ballot didn't come in. So, they had, so uh, which demonstrated to me that the system is working and working well uh, for that. Uh, it's, while we're still on this, uh, with vote by mail, how do you ensure people can vote? They don't have a traditional address, mailbox. These are people experiencing homelessness, homes and reservations. They don't have a traditional streets number, things like that. So the, 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 a person with a non-traditional street address or location, how can they vote by mail? So we have uh, people who are actually in that situation. And many years ago, when I was at a conference with the Department of Justice, they said, of course, those individuals are entitled to vote and it is wherever they return home at night. And so we have to assign a precinct for those voters and they need to tell us what that address is. But we also are able to mail a ballot to a PO box or somewhere that they can pick up the mail. Sometimes they make uh, arrangements with the a road home or a shelter or whatever. 
but they do have the right to vote and we try to accommodate those individuals. There aren't very many of them, but nevertheless, there are people that fall into those situations. And beyond making sure that we have a mailing address for them, like like Sherry said, sometimes they can we can mail it to a PO box once we've assigned them a precinct. Beyond that, we also have in-person voting. This is one reason why we have early voting uh, before election day in person and in-person voting on election days. We want to make sure that people that didn't get a mail ballot, that they have another way to vote. And every county has that this election by law. You know, one of the other capabilities that we have is um, we need an address, but sometimes addresses are, are you know, a little bit strange. I know the, the question brought up reservations and, and this happens in, in rural areas where, you know, someone's address is two miles northeast of highway, you know, pick your number. Um, and we have GIS capabilities where um, if we know the actual location of someone, we can put an XY coordinate, put a pin in that spot, and that helps us know which precinct they are in. Um, sometimes that makes it difficult by mail, but like Amelia said, that's why we have in-person voting. But we have ways of, of making sure we know people are getting the right ballot. And, and you know, I think that's something that we'll continue to work on over the years. I don't think we're perfect at it, um, but, but that's something that we do have the capability to do is make sure we get people in the right physical location and get them the right ballot. So a couple of issues uh, that have erupted nationally, but also uh, here and was dealt with in a special session. Uh, Sherry talked about it a couple of months ago is chasing the voter. Uh, it's now called harvesting of ballots. Uh, can we talk a little bit about that? What happened in the special session? And what, 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 does, what does that mean, harvesting a ballot or chasing the voters that usually happens with the vote by mail? Oh, well, harvesting. Oh, oh, go ahead, Sherry. Our definition, when I looked it up, um, people who received a cure letter meaning that there was either an issue that their signature didn't match with their vote by mail ballot, or they didn't sign their affidavit on their ballot return envelope. So we had uh, campaigns when there was close contests, uh, just trying to get those voters to turn in that letter that we send them, we call it a cure letter. And um, it caused a little bit of confusion for the voters, especially if they'd already responded to our cure letter. But that was one definition that I had looked up that they called a harvesting or vote harvesting. The, Ricky. the other one that you may have heard of deal you know, like in North Carolina or in California or others where uh, the campaigns or parties or unions or some kind of entity will actually send people out to assist voters uh, in returning their, their voted ballot. Uh, in some states that is perfectly fine and legal. In Utah, it has been illegal for a, a long time, and they just strengthened it in August. The legislature made uh, stiffened the penalties and clarified some of the laws around ballot harvesting. So now in Utah, it is illegal to collect uh, a ballot from someone else um, and turn that in unless you live, reside in the same household, you're a postal worker, or you're a, an election judge. Other than that, you just can't do it. Um, now. Even if you did, we still have the same controls in place. That envelope has to be genuine. The ballot has to be genuine. Uh, the barcodes need to match up with the temporary voter IDs and we and the signature is gonna have to match. So we still have those controls in place, but the pen penalties are gonna be stiffer now for someone who wants to try to harvest ballots in Utah. So if you're- yeah, holding, Go ahead, Justin, go ahead. I think, I think it's important to point out that this isn't something we've had a big problem with here in Utah. Um, we think it's been prohibited in, by the law for, for many years now. Um, I, I tried to go back and find the oldest code book I could with, with the prohibition and, and I had to give up because it was very old. Um, but we think it's been prohibited for a long time. We haven't seen a major problem. Historically, we've had you know, a few candidates reach out every year and ask if they can go collect ballots, but we haven't seen any indication that this is happening on any, any kind of scale. Um, so I think the legislature did a good thing by strengthening it, but it wasn't a problem that, that we were experiencing in any kind of real level. Well, I know that in the uh, race two years ago, the 4th Congressional District, uh, both parties were uh, banging away at these ballots that were out there after the election day. I know with, with Sherry and uh, Amelia wasn't there yet, but they were trying to get these people to get the, those issues figured out. 
And because that thing went, went two weeks or three weeks after election. Two weeks, yeah. Uh, trying to figure out uh, the, the, these ballots were still you know, either still out there or getting cured. And there was a lot of questions about that. I don't think anyone did anything wrong, but there were a lot of questions because everyone's trying to assume the ballots show up. And so that raised some questions when you had groups from both camps trying to get, get, garner these ballots after election day. Well, and they really weren't ballots they were trying to get. They were trying to get them to return what we call a cure letter that we'd mail to the voter, notifying them that there was an issue with their signature, either the envelope uh, affidavit wasn't signed or it didn't match. So they were trying to get their supporters to get those cure letters back into us so their ballot could be counted. And so that's what cure. So, so just so the questions have been asking in Utah, you just can't go around and collect those ballots unless you live with the person or that's, or you're a postal worker. So I think Rick, yeah, there, there's two, there's ballot harvesting, which really takes place before people vote. I wanna go get your ballot from you and turn, on, turn it in on your behalf. And then there's vote harvesting, which happens once the ballot has been turned in and there's an issue and a cure letter has been sent out. Then I'm trying to go make sure you fix that thing, you cure the issue so your vote is counted. Okay, that's it. so. Um, pandemic issues uh, in the primary election in June. This a lot of people saw this happening. Ballots were sent in. They were held for 24 hours because of any potential for the virus being on it. Uh, looks like that's a that's still happening, but it's a little bit different. Do you want to talk a little about that, uh, uh, Sherry or Ricky or Amelia, about the efforts you're taking for, um, for the any concerns about the pandemic? So because of the um, information that we got on a national level with the post office and their, their medical experts, they said that the virus wouldn't live on paper on the ballots for more than three hours. So we were quarantining ballots for 24 hours, just to be sure, because we didn't want them running through our, our machines and spreading anything. But this time, it may not be a 24 hour quarantine. It might be less, it might be several hours when we bring them back to the government center before we start processing them. Yeah. So, and same thing here. I mean, most, I like I mentioned, most people are returning their ballots through drop boxes. And those drop boxes are big metal boxes that sit in the sun. So it does get quite hot in there. Um, I think we were told that the, that the virus dies around like 130 degrees Fahrenheit or something. And, and it gets pretty hot in those boxes. But like Sherry said, by the time you drive down and drop it off in that box, and then our person comes and picks it up, there would be very few that would be within that three hour window. Uh, especially if it went through the, through the mail, if it went through the postal system, obviously it was gone for more than three hours. And so there really isn't as much of a need to quarantine ballots this election. Same thing in Weber. We'll probably quarantine, but it'll be uh, much shorter than it was in the past. So we had a couple minutes left. Uh, so, uh, Justin, on election laws, it has to be postmarked the day before, the day of. Can you clarify that? Yeah, that has to be postmarked no later than the day before election day. Um, for the primary election, um, the legislature moved that to election day. But for November, we're back to our, our normal day before election day for postmarking ballots. And the important reminder we always want to give voters there is different post offices will postmark at different times during the day. Um, so your post office may stop postmarking at uh, two or three in the afternoon, depending where you're at. So the, our local post office is another great thing about having longstanding relationships. They'll put signs out on the big blue boxes outside, letting people know they need to go inside if they want to postmark. But to be sure on that last day, we encourage people to walk it into the office, uh, have, a, have a stamp there so they make sure it's postmarked or just drop it in the drop box um, if you're getting in those last days before the election. And then there's no question about it getting straight to the election officials and being counted. And the ballot drop box, oh, sorry. The ballot drop boxes, if they use our drop boxes, they're, they're eligible to be dropped until 8 p.m. on election night. So if a voter is trying to get their ballot back in the mail, they're worried about it getting postmarked by the day before election day, they can use the drop boxes or even take it to one of the vote centers and that's eligible until 8 p.m. on election night. So real quickly, because this question has come up, it was in some articles in national publications. Some people say there may not be that much confusion nationally because 
some uh, in some states they start counting the ballots when they get them so that when they start releasing that. So in Utah, a couple things. What are the laws about when you can re start reporting results and, and when do you start actually start counting ballots? And will, will the mail-in ballots be part of the walk-in or in-person votes? Real quickly, can we talk about that? We start processing ballots, getting them ready to count as soon as they come back and we'll start receiving them. You know, they're going to be the majority, the masses will be mailed out on October 13th. We'll start seeing ballots coming back by the end of that week. And so then that next week, we'll start um, processing ballots, having people check signatures. Um, and, and during that process, leading up to election night, we actually start scanning them because those many, many thousands of ballots take time to process through the scanners. And then uh, none of the results can be seen who's ahead in which race, but the results are not released until after the polls close at 8 p.m. on election night. I think that's standard across the board. We start, we start processing ballots as soon as we get them. Uh, in Utah County, we're expecting about 250,000 voted ballots, and we just wouldn't have time to do that on election day. And so we start as soon as we can. We just don't activate really the, the part of the tabulation process that shows us the results. We don't do that until just before we post results. So we're processing ballots all the way from the time we get them on the 13th. We, you know, people start shoving them in those drop boxes the day they get them. So we start processing right away and we don't activate that until like 7.45 PM on election night so that we're ready to post results at eight o'clock but we process the whole time. And I think that actually helps us be able to have good results on election night. Right. So real quickly before we go, uh, what things would you like to see added or changed for this election or future elections? How do you see your roles changing uh, because of this election and in the future? What, so things you'd like to see, things that are going to happen, changing your roles. So well, Justin, do you want to start out? passed a huge bill um, with, with a ton of input from the county clerks uh, who really did most of the work on it to get our election code updated to, to match with our vote by mail practices. So I got my, my legislative Christmas present this year. That, that was the big thing we wanted to get through. Um, I, I won't be surprised if we see some national legislation um, that, that standardizes some things across the country. We saw that um, after the 2000 election, uh, Help America Vote Act was passed. So I won't be surprised if we see um, some standardization on, on a few things across the country. Right. Uh, my Christmas wish would be uh, that voters, candidates, parties, elected officials, anybody, if they have concerns or something seems like it's wrong or off, that they call their trusted election official, either their state office or their local. If they did that and actually asked the question of the people who are administering elections, I think you'd see a lot of these uh, rumors and, and issues go away. Okay. And I would have liked to have seen us be able to uh, extend that deadline for postmarks to election day for this election. It's always sad to me when I see ballots that are postmarked too late and we can't count them. So I would have loved to have seen that change, but they didn't do that. So uh, we just need to make sure that voters are aware that they need to get their ballots postmarked before election day. Amelia? Yeah. yeah, you know, mine is a little specific. I, the next thing that I would love to see is I would love for my county or statewide to be able to implement a system that had real time communication with the voter. So mm -hmm. when we printed your ballot and sent it to you, I would love you to get a text message or an email that says, we dropped your ballot in the mail and it should be coming. And then to be able to say, hey, we received your ballot and we're sending it through signature verification. Another text message that says your signature was verified and we're tabulating your ballot. Or your signature was unable, we were unable to verify your signature, please contact us so that we can count your ballot. I would love to have that real time. I know. Um, a lot of the counties in Colorado have that. So that's my next wish list is be able to have that real time communication with the voters. I think it increases confidence. Um, and, and I think that's incredibly important, transparency and confidence. Um, and as far as our roles, 
I think that the majority of the changes in elections need to be local. I, I like to see less at the, at the federal level, less at the state level, and I like to see more at the local level. I know that me having 300,000 active registered voters is very different than some of the smaller counties in Utah, and I don't want my wish list to dictate what they do and vice versa. I don't want their wish list to dictate what I do. So I would love to see those changes come locally. And specifically, I would love to see some innovation and me have the ability to communicate in real time with my voters. That's great, great. Uh, that, that is a worthy wish and desire and I hope we can get there. Well, thank you to the panel. Thank you so much. Uh, look, at anyone who watches this is gonna feel great that they live in a state that has such dedicated public servants and obviously the commitment comes through. So thank you for that. And we wanna thank the, the audience for your participation in this. And, and we also wanna thank the Hinkley Institute and all the sponsors of this project, because it's only through these type of activities do we enhance the confidence in our democracy, which is at the bottom line, which is the most important. So thank you. Thank you.